This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to take a moment to welcome members of our armed forces who are joining us today from remote locations around the world, and also our nation's veterans. Thank you for being with us again. I also want to welcome new listeners in Idaho, Georgia, Florida, and Washington. Thank you for your many email messages and support. Thanks to you, the Costa Report is now the fastest-growing postpartisan news magazine in the country. In just a moment, journalist Molly Knight Raskin will be joining us to talk about the first victim on American Airlines Flight 11, which crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center on 9-11. It's a riveting story which demonstrates how history might have taken a very different turn had one passenger, Daniel Lewin, been assigned a different seat. But before Ms. Raskin joins us, let me tell you a little about her background. Molly Knight Raskin is a graduate of the Columbia School of Journalism. She began her career as a reporter for Fairchild Publications, but it didn't take long before Raskin's rare talent for investigative journalism began showing itself. She was hired as a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, as well as the News Hour with Jim Lair. She also reported and wrote for Scientific America, The Washington Post, Psychology Today, and other major publications. In addition to researching and writing the best-selling book, No Better Time, The Brief Remarkable Life of Danny Lewin, the genius who transformed the Internet, Raskin is credited with two documentary movies. I also want to be sure that I mention that she is the recipient of the Rosalind Carter Fellowship for Mental Health Journalism and the prestigious American Psychoanalytic Association Award for Excellence in Journalism. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report veteran reporter, author, and humanitarian, Ms. Molly Knight Raskin. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. In just a moment, we're going to talk about Daniel Lewin. But before we do, uh, how did you come upon this story, and why did you feel it was important to write about? Well, I've been a journalist for about 15 years now, and so and I was searching out great stories. That's part of my job, or it is my job. Um, but Danny's, the story of Danny Lewin came to me really not through searching out stories. It came to me sort of, I, I say by accident, or sort of as a blessing, uh, when I was in conversation with a friend, and it was shortly before the 10th anniversary of September 11th, um, and I was just speaking to somebody about the anniversary, and he said, you know, I have this story of this of, of a friend that's incredible that that I really wish somebody would tell. And the more I heard uh, about Danny, the more I became just completely fascinated by his story, and the more I wondered why hasn't this story ever been told before. And so that's when I went home and I started to do some research and make some phone calls and and within a couple of days, really, I'd made up my mind that, that I wanted to write a book. Now, prior to this, had you covered disasters or any terrorism stories? Well, I had. Um, in a sort of strange uh, twist, the very first week of my year spent in graduate school for journalism was the week of September 11, 2001. Um, I was attending a master's program in New York City at Columbia University, and it was actually my first day of reporting for the program. So I was out going to cover a city council election when I heard on the news that this this plane had hit the World Trade Center. And, you know, it really totally informed my year, obviously. I mean, it informed my year as, as a resident of New York City, as a human being, but also as a journalist. And I spent the year covering... Um, a lot of tragedy and stories of lives that were lost. And from that, you know, I went on to um, to cover all sorts of things. I moved on to a different newspaper at the Baltimore Sun in Baltimore and covered a lot of crime and stories there that were tragic. So, um, you know, I really view it as sort of part, part of my work as a journalist. And um, so, you know, I had covered tragedy before, but I'd never heard Danny's story in all of those stories of September 11, 2001, which was the day he died. I, I had never heard anything about him. I could see that uh, 9-11 had an indelible impact uh, on your views, and particularly in how you treated this story. 
Um, so when you first heard about it, you said, you know, you'd never heard about it. You, you, you went home, you started doing some research, and within a couple of days, uh, you were pretty sure that this was something that moved you and you wanted to write about it. So where did you start? Well, you know, the, the jumping off point, you know, what, what I'd heard about Danny's story was that he was the very first victim of September 11, 2001. Now, I had never really um, heard this as fact. I hadn't heard about anybody really who had been the very first victim. And so I immediately wondered, how does anybody know that? And how could that be true? But then it wasn't, I mean, that, that's just sort of a, a, a fact and in and of itself wasn't too significant. It was just interesting to me. And then I was told through his friends that he fought back on that flight and that it was a little known story that he was heroic that day. And that was something else that intrigued me. I mean, I had heard so much about the other flights that day, about efforts by passengers to heroically try and stop the terrorists. But I had never heard the story of this young man on American Airlines Flight 11, which was the first the first plane to crash into the World Trade Center that morning. Um, and then, but, but these facts, again, in, in, in and of themselves, were not um, the catalyst for me to write this book. It was when I started hearing about who Danny Lewin was and how he lived that I was totally inspired. I actually really felt sometimes like I wasn't even writing about somebody that that was real because he had such a sensational life. And, um, you know, he had created this Internet company that, that really changed the face of the way the Internet worked. And, and in this tragic twist of irony, created this amazing Today, it's a huge company, multi-billion dollar company, controls 30% of the world's internet traffic. But the day he died or was tragically killed was also the day on which so many people turned to his technology to find out what was going on in the world that day. And so all of these elements taken together um, really made, for me, just a fascinating portrait of somebody and somebody that I really wanted to write about. Well, you're absolutely right. He, in many ways, was responsible for the technology that the news media used to get the story and to also warn people uh, about what was going on when as 9-11 was occurring. Without his technology, we really, I mean, the Internet would have just literally shut down. And and so it's a, there, there's just a, um, I don't know, there's a poetic part of this story that this person had spent their life opening up the speed and the bandwidth of the internet and uh, becomes the first victim of 9-11 and that, and that that technology was the very technology that allowed us to understand what was going on uh, during the crises. Now, at some point, you must have decided that this is a story that goes beyond an article or just a, a, a report. Uh, you're going to actually involve yourself in a full book. How did you make that decision? Well, you know, to me, it was absolutely clear to me, as I said very quickly, that I wanted to write a book. And, you know, for me, it, it's not an easy decision to make as a journalist. And I've done all kinds of reporting from long form to short, from television to um, long magazine stories. And I think that's always the question when you set out to write a book is, you know, is this going to be worthy of you know, however many pages, um, are people going to sit down and really want to read this? And again, I think what was unusual for me is that I've, I've toyed, I had toyed with the idea of writing a book prior to this, but this time around, the more I read about Danny, um, it was almost as if this story kind of grabbed me by the claws. I really can't explain it other than to say that, you know, I'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking, this is how I want to write it. This is what I want to tell. I want the world to know the story. And it, there were other elements, of course, to me that were all interesting. I mean, I actually had no background in Internet technology or computer science. I'm an English major, um, frankly, just sort of frightened by very high-level mathematics. Um, and so it was, for me, almost an innate decision, I think. But I think you made the right choice because there certainly was enough material to make a compelling book. And we have to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to walk through what happened to the first hero and victim of the 9-11 attacks. You're listening to the Costa Report. Did you know that every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data 
and that 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone, this data comes from everywhere and it affects everyone. This data is big data. Big data is all data, and it's more than simply a matter of size. Big data represents an opportunity to uncover new insights, make your business more agile, and answer questions that were previously beyond your reach. IBM's big data platform uses sophisticated technologies and patented advanced analytics designed to complement your existing information infrastructure. The IBM Big Data platform allows you to get started quickly today and expand to address more complex problems tomorrow. It doesn't matter where you start, it matters that you start. Find out how IBM can help you turn big data into a competitive advantage by visiting ibm.com slash big data today. Every day our world gets more complicated. Not only is new information coming at us faster than we can manage, new regulations, technology, and the effects of globalization have made it much more difficult to succeed. That's why I wrote The Watchman's Rattle, a book that, for the first time, explains how complexity makes it hard to separate facts from fiction and eventually causes us to make important decisions based on unproven beliefs. And not just us, our leaders also fall prey to this phenomena. But here's the good news. Once you know the symptoms to watch for, you can safeguard against them. So please, go to RebeccaCosta.com. That's RebeccaCosta.com. And order your copy of The Watchman's Rattle. It only takes a few minutes and the shipping is free. That's RebeccaCosta.com. Do it now. You'll be glad you did. Mother's Day is this weekend. What gift do you want to receive? Drop a hint or treat yourself to refreshed, youthful eyes. Finally get rid of those bags and puffiness under your eyes. Introducing GenuCell Stem Cell Therapy for bags and puffiness under the eyes. Rosa from California wrote, I felt the bags under my eyes firm up and the skin was glowing. Your product helped me reduce puffiness immediately, and in a couple of weeks, I stopped using concealer because of the improvement. Actually, I've gone a week without applying heavy makeup. I would recommend to anyone I've noticed a great difference. And with its instant effects, you'll see GenuCell working in the first 12 hours, guaranteed or your money back. Plus, for even younger and smoother skin, Chamonix will give you the legendary Esotique anti-wrinkle treatment absolutely free just for trying GenuCell today. Call 800-901-0636. That's 800-901-0636. Call this week and express shipping is also free with our Mother's Day promotion. That's 800-901-0636. Hi, this is Ethan Behrman, a host on the ZBS Radio Network, and I'd like to introduce you to the all-new ZBSRadio.com. ZBS Radio brings you a variety of talk radio programming on subjects like health and nutrition, politics, personal finance, gardening, pet care, technology, and so much more. At ZBSRadio.com, you'll find podcasts as well as live and on-demand streams of exciting and informative talk radio programming that's available to you 24 hours hours a day, seven days a week on your computer or mobile phone. Listen on the web using our streaming player or in your iTunes or other listening software. Also, be sure to check the app section of our website to find mobile apps that make listening to your favorite shows even easier. Check the shows page at zbsradio.com to see our current lineup of shows. New shows will be added all the time. Thank you for listening to the ZBS Radio Network. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is journalist and documentary filmmaker Molly Knight Raskin. And before the break, we were learning about how she came upon Daniel Lewin's story and what compelled her to write the book. So on the morning of 9-11, American Airlines Flight 11 leaves Boston Logan Airport for Los Angeles. And 46 minutes later, the plane crashes into the North Tower. Pioneer... Daniel Lewin happens to be sitting in seat 9B. So maybe we can start with the significance of seat 9B and what investigators have been able to piece together. Well, what we do know for a fact, um, the facts gathered carefully by the 9-11 Commission in the years following the September attacks, is that the flight manifest showed that 
seat 9B in business class was occupied by Daniel Lewin, by Danny Lewin. And we also know that Danny was, in essence, surrounded by five of the terrorists who five terrorists who hijacked the flight that day. They were seated as well in business class. And, um, you know, terrifyingly within basically arm's reach of, of where Danny was sitting. Or certainly Mohammed Atta was, the ringleader of the attacks, was seated within arm's reach of Danny. Um, so we know that, that Danny was in that seat um, surrounded by these terrorists. We know that at some point after the flight, the hijacking had begun, that Danny rose from his seat and engaged in some kind of a struggle with one of the terrorists on board. The details of this are, um, are not known. And so I'm very careful in the book to say he may, he was almost certainly the first victim of September 11th. He was killed in that struggle. He was stabbed in the neck and killed, um, tragically. And we do know that he rose from his seat. We don't know what happened in between the time he rose from his seat and the time he was, um, murdered by the terrorists. Now, how do we know that he rose from his seat and he was stabbed? We know this from uh, there were two flight attendants on board American Airlines Flight 11 who, in- incredibly brave, courageous young women, who were able to radio down to ground control or use their cell phones to call ground control during some of those terrifying minutes of the flight. They were not in business class, but they were able to relay some of the information from passengers who were sort of spilling back at the time and telling them what was going on. Mm -hmm. And they called ground control and the, uh, those who were on, on the the lines took copious notes and then began recording those calls. And so we know those from the FBI transcripts from those, those actual recordings. Now, it turns out that Daniel Lewin was not only a bodybuilder and an imposing figure, but he also served in the most elite Israeli counterterrorism unit. Is that right? That is right. Um, you know, it's, again, one of these things where truth can be stranger than fiction. And it was really the ultimate twist of irony, um, in addition to the fact that his technology kept the Internet so many sites live that day, was the fact that Danny had trained in this extremely elite unit of the Israeli army. Um, it's called Sirat Matkal, and it's a counterterrorism unit and really known as one of the most elite, actually, in the world. And he, had, he was Israeli-American and had trained in this unit um, from the age of 18 to about 21 years old. And so he was well-versed in terrorism techniques. He knew conversational Arabic. And as you mentioned, physically, he was um, what his friends call a warrior. I mean, he really bucked the sort of stereotypical tr- a stereotype of a MIT mathematician and computer scientist, which was that he was very buff and very physically adept. So because of his training with this Israeli counterterrorism unit, he might have uh, noticed that something was awry very early on. And trying to stop the hijackers would, would have been a completely normal response to Lewin. Well, yes, uh, and and I make that case in the book. I mean, again, I'm, I'm careful to say that, you know, we don't know and we will never know exactly what happened on that flight during those few minutes. But what we do know are the facts which that he rose from his seat. We know that he was engaged in some kind of a struggle. We know he was stabbed. You know, throughout the course of my research for the book, I interviewed over 150 people who knew Danny very well, and every single one of them said unequivocally that, the minute Danny knew something was happening on that flight, he would have tried to stop it. Again, he was a trained warrior. He was somebody who, even after he left the Army, took this sort of fighting mentality with him wherever he went. And, you know, he was literally engaged in a, in a sort of a friendly, um, you know, physical struggle with someone in the office over a decision related to the board of his company. And so he was very physical it was it, it was instinctual for him to get up and fight back, and so everybody who knew him well said I, they know without a shadow of a doubt that he was a hero that day, and um, and I think many people consider him a hero that day. And um, having researched the book and and really gotten to know him throughout the process, I I do consider him him one. It's it's interesting when you, uh, you, you know, one of our, our great talents as human beings is we can do thought experiments. We can imagine the scenario given very, you know, the facts that we do have available. So we're, we're looking at someone who had been trained in counterterrorism. 
by the best military trainers in the world, the Israelis. Uh, he's now sitting in business class, and, and we now know where the terrorists were seated. And it is very clear that they are in front of him, behind him, and to bo- both sides. Uh, so uh, it, it boggles the mind to think that had he not been in business class, had he been at the rear of the plane, uh, that history might have been changed. There might have, might have been a, a greater opportunity for him. Well, you know, that's that's what I think is so difficult to live with for, for everybody who knew him. And, and all of the victims that day, you know, their loved ones, people who knew them have so many what ifs. And, and it was really a day full of that. You know, I, I, I will never forget sitting there thinking, you know, writing all of these stories and, and telling the stories of lives that are lost and thinking, what if, what if they had missed the ferry that morning? What if they hadn't gone to work that day? And, and, but, you know, it was really, um, I think really particularly searing irony for the people that knew Danny Lewin, because he, he did get on the flight that morning and was seated in a spot in business class where you know, um, I mean, as you mentioned, as a storyteller, it was, it was really my job was to put myself there. And, um, you know, I kind of put that off as long as I could during the writing of the book because I was really, you know, enjoying writing about Danny's life, the way he lived. And when I had to write about the way he died and imagined getting on that flight that morning and um, really, I'm convinced, you know, aware of what was happening much sooner than anybody else on that plane. I mean, again, somebody who knew conversational Arabic, who lived in the Middle East, who had been in an army and actively sought out um, terrorists. And there's no doubt but that he knew something was up the minute he paid attention to his surroundings. But, you know, all of his, his, his army mates said to me, look, you could be the best warrior in the world, but you are not trained to uh, overcome a situation when there's somebody behind you with a weapon. You don't know. He didn't know that someone was seated behind him, and he could have never known. And so you're right. I mean, had he been seated somewhere else that day and been able to engage some other passengers to fight back, maybe maybe, maybe things would have been different. But again, who would have ever thought those planes would have been flown into buildings and used as weapons? Absolutely. It was inconceivable up to the, the mm-hmm. moment that the event happened. Uh, we have to take another short break, but stay right where you are, you're at. Uh, we'll be back with more from Molly Knight Raskin. You're listening to The Costa Report. One of my new customs is to put open bottles of red and white wine on my table so my guests can serve themselves, but not just any wine. In my home, I want to serve the best, and that's wine from Caraccioli Cellars. So this year, I asked winemaker Scott Caraccioli for a suggestion on what I should serve. Come dinner time, it's always a good idea to have a bottle of nice Chardonnay as well as Pinot Noir on your table. That way you have a selection for every guest that walks through your door. But the best way to start the evening is definitely with a bottle of bubbles, preferably Brut Rosé, to really get the celebration in, in the mode of the holidays. Oh, you're absolutely right. It's, there's something about the bubbles that gets everybody going. Yeah, it's really a an infusion of happiness. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. So I'll start with the bubbles and then move on to the red and white on my table, and then I'll have everyone covered. Unless people want to keep going with the bubbles, which I always advise. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thanks, Scott. You, there's only one, and we exist because of you. To provide the care you need when you need it, Physicians Medical Group has over 300 providers just in Santa Cruz County. That's over 300 teammates focused on the one, the only, you. With over 42 specialties and 100 locations, you'll find the right provider for you. Find your teammate, your Physicians Medical Group care provider, by visiting our website, pmgscc.com. Greetings, folks. This is Randy the Realtor. You may have heard my ads before on this station, and I'm here to tell you that MZ is right. He doesn't let stupid people listen to his radio station. Everyone who called me because they heard my radio spots have been very intelligent and wonderful people that I was glad to even have had a conversation with. A couple of my most recent contacts are Lewis and Susan. They recently opened an antique clock shop in Aptos on the corner of Trout Gulch and Soquel Drive. Go by and visit them. 
If you need a nice antique clock or need one repaired, stop in and see them. If you need to buy or sell a home, give me a call. I'll make your transaction run like clockwork. Call Randy the Realtor at 831-566-2590. That's 831-566-2590. Or visit my website at aptoshomefinder.com. Hello? Hi, Grandma. No, Grandma, I can't fix your computer. I'm sorry it's so slow, but I don't know what to do with it. You clicked on what? You better call user-friendly computing, because I can fix any PC, Mac, or laptop. They'll even come to your house and pick it up. But if you bring it to the shop, they'll give you a free $50 diagnostic just for saying you heard their ad on KSCO. No, Grandma. Downloading that free internet software won't save you time or money. Let's face it, most of your computer problems these days start with the user being tricked into clicking on a link that contains a path to computer hell. User-friendly computing will have you back on track fast. User-friendly computing is locally owned at 505 River Street across from Gateway Plaza, or you can give them a call at 831-423-9653. That's 831-423-9653. Michael Olson's second law of the food chain. The farther we go from the source of our food, the less control we have over what's in our food. Now that so much of our food comes from thousands of miles away, we should all get together Saturday at 9 a.m. as the Food Chain Radio Show tracks down who is putting what in our food. If you have a comment about the second law of the food chain, tell me. Michael Olson, all about it at MetroFarm.com. Now, see you all on KSEO Saturday at 9 a.m. for some What's Eating What Radio on the Food Chain. What day was that? Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Molly Knight Raskin. And in the previous segment, we were talking about the fact that Lewin had been trained by and served with an elite Israeli counterterrorism unit. But owing to where he was seated, he was surrounded by five terrorists, allowing him very little opportunity to successfully thwart the hijacking. Now, I have to ask you, um, was there any point in your investigation when you wondered whether the hijackers had information about the passengers on the plane and arranged to be seated behind and around him, or, or were you convinced that this was just a coincidence? There's no indication to me in any of the research or findings uh, from the 9-11 Commission from the the thorough reporting of the events of that morning that it was anything but random to me. Um, You know, it's truly, it it is truly bizarre, and and there have been all sorts of theories about why, why Danny Lewin would be seated among these terrorists on this flight in business class. But there was no credible you know, answer to me. There was nothing that made a convincing case for the fact that it was anything but random. There are going to be people that will obviously spin this differently. We have lots of people who have come up with conspiracy theories, and then unfortunately, a coincidence like this gets heaped on to that conspiracy theory. Um, the likelihood that you would have someone uh, who had been trained by the Israelis in counterterrorism. Right, who was an imposing figure and a bodybuilder like Daniel Lewin, uh, and then he happens to be seated in the middle of where the activity is going on. It just, uh, you can understand how some people will say, how is that possible? That's a big plane. That was a large plane. Well, for sure, I can understand how people would just say that's an incredibly bizarre um, circumstance. And it was bizarre to me. And um, I can certainly, um, well, I can't, you know, fully understand. I can see how people would, you know, come up with theories as to why they would have been on the flight that morning seated uh, there. But the really, the, the real issue becomes, um, can you give these theories any credibility when you start taking them to the next level? So, you know, if it wasn't random, then who put him on the plane and why was he there? And to what purpose did, did his presence on that flight serve? And once you start going down that road, um, there's really nothing about it that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. So 
to me, it was completely random. Um, I didn't speak to anybody really throughout the process of researching the book who thought that it was anything but. Um, because, again, the sort of, if you will call them conspiracy theories, um, don't add up to much once you start pursuing or, you know, following the leads any further. Right. Well, I'm a, I'm really happy you said that <laughs> because I do get a lot of emails from uh, people who send me giant reports and um, I have to remind them that just because certain events occurred within the same time frame does not mean one is causal. Uh, but we tend to get confused about that. Now, let's talk about Lewin's contribution to technology because his inventions really did touch all of us. Uh, He was a mathematician, is that right? That's right. He was a mathematician. He was a mathematician at heart. Uh, He he had trained in the Israeli army. He was Israeli-American, but he came to to Boston, to Cambridge, in the mid-'90s as a graduate student at MIT, and at the time, He was attending the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, which was uh, arguably and still is today one of the best in the world for computer science and technology. And he was really, you know, just a brilliant mind. I mean, uh, and again, not coming from me, but coming from everybody who knew him and everybody who worked with him at MIT, you know, students from all over the world said it was just remarkable how quick on his, uh, you know, how quick his mind worked. And he was really interested in theoretical math. And at the time, you know, everybody was trying to figure out how are we going to grow and scale the Internet. The Internet was was just this incredible technology in the mid-'90s. It was really taking off. But there were impediments to mass growth of the Internet and mass usage of it. And one of them was how slow the Internet could get when traffic got clogged up and signals got stuck. Mm -hmm. And that's what Danny and his professor at MIT, Tom Layton, really set out to uh, solve using math, which was at first, I think, a kind of an audacious idea, you know, use math to solve this this problem of the Internet. Um, But they did, and they did it successfully. Now, prior to the dot-com crash, uh, Lewin's company, Akamai, went public, and he and his partners became overnight billionaires. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, that was a really thrilling part of the book to write, you know, not not just because of the vast sort of staggering amounts of wealth that were was created, not only by the, the IPO of their company, but by that whole time period, you know, it's just really unlike anything we've ever seen, these companies that were literally being created on, you know, the back of a cocktail napkin were getting <laughs> funding from from VCs that were just, you know, staggering numbers and the valuation of these companies was huge. And Akamai was no exception. And, and yeah, I mean, Danny went from Again, you know, just an incredible story. I mean, he was a really struggling graduate student in every sense of the word. He was married with a young family, squashed into a, a student housing dormitory, trying to make ends meet. And and with this IPO of the company, which happened so fast, you know, he went from working on a master's thesis to this overnight explosion of a company, uh, became yeah an overnight billionaire, uh, worth billions on paper. Um, a lot of people were worth a lot of money after the IPO of Akamai, and it was really a, a crazy, crazy time. And then we should point out that once the dot-com crash happened, Akamai was, uh, found itself fighting for its life. And, and on 9-11, he was, uh, in fact, traveling to a business meeting on behalf of Akamai. Absolutely. Akamai was no exception to the dot-com crash. Uh, you know, the bubble burst in 2000, and, and you know, that really meant for Akamai, you know, Akamai was a software company, as a software company, so they were providing, and still today provide, solutions for Internet companies to move their content um, and also to secure their content, so to move it fastly, securely, and efficiently. And but what happened during the bust was that, you know, Akamai's technology still worked, but their customers were going out of business like, you know, like dominoes. Mm-hmm. And so they really had to refocus. And that's what Danny Lewin was in the process of doing on September 11th. When he got on that flight, he was going out to California to meet with some business folks and try and kind of restructure the business, um, you know, close down some operations, lay some people off. And, uh, you know, fortunately, the company survived. And I think 
uh, and I know that's because what the essence of the company, it wasn't sort of a fly in the sky, pie in the sky, dot com idea that was clever. It was much more than that. It was a mathematical solution to moving content on the internet and it worked and it worked well and it still works today. And so it was a lasting contribution. And I think um, that's also difficult for those who knew him. If only he could see what, what he had built, you know, live to see what he had built. What happened to Ak- Akamai uh, at following 9-11 and, and Danny's death? Well, as you might imagine, I mean, the day of September 11th was it was horrific for the whole company. I mean, it was still a small company, and it was one that had been built, you know, hand-to-hand, brick-and-mortar, blood, sweat, tears, you know. And um, Danny had hired so many of the people who were at the company at that time. And so, you know, the minute they found out or figured out that Danny was on that flight that morning, um, you know, I think there was just this this huge hole. It's, it's, they were gutted. Everybody was gutted and they felt like they had lost the heart and soul of the whole company. Mm-hmm. I but, think it was you know, a similar experience when Apple lost Steve Jobs. Uh, yeah, you really absolutely. feel you lost the heart and soul of the company. Unfortunately, we have to take our last break, but we'll be back right after these short commercial messages. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. The crisis in the Ukraine is the latest global conflict to pit the United States against Vladimir Putin's Russia. While the Cold War may have ended, U.S.-Russia diplomacy is here to stay. Understanding this volatile new era is not easy. For many years, experts have been trying to explain Russia's new leadership, but cracking the inner circle has remained elusive until now. The American Program Bureau represents some of the most knowledgeable and prominent Russian insiders who are available to speak to your organization. Experts such as Mikhail Gorbachev former leader of the Soviet Union and master architect of modern-day Russia. Vladimir Posner, the dean of Russian journalism. Andrei Kosarev, the first foreign minister under Boris Yeltsin. And Pavel Palashenko, chief advisor for 25 years to Gorbachev, are available to speak at your next event. No Speakers Bureau offers greater insights into how Russia impacts our economy, our world, and our lives. To schedule these esteemed leaders for your next event, contact the American Program Bureau at 800-225-4575 or apbspeakers.com. Calling all dogs. Bring your human out to the 13th annual Sea Dog Spring Dog Festival on Sunday, May 18th at SoCal High School from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Help the Coastal Dog Owners Group raise dollars to benefit the lives of local canines and kids. This year's event will feature an adoptable dog showcase, shopping, games, lure coursing, and the popular Fetch a Wave photo booth. Go to CoastalDogs.com for event details and to purchase tickets in advance. <laughs> 
My name is Debbie, and I'm from Aptos. About four years ago, I remodeled my house, and it was professionally decorated. I wanted it to look like a magazine inside, so of course, the end was beautiful plants. But how am I going to take care of them? So I called Jungle Plant, and Dale gave me a fabulous estimate. She comes in faithfully every week, waters, dusts, fertilizes, takes such great care of my indoor plants. And believe me, I have 15 of them, everything from a large ficus to beautiful orchids. She's totally professional, trustworthy. She comes in when I'm not there. I really depend on her to keep things looking great and she's become my really good friend. She's really knowledgeable about plants, knows where to put them so that they thrive and if something goes wrong, she replaces the plants. My plants are a big part of my home decor and I love looking at them and feeling something alive and green. So thanks to Jungle Plant, my home is complete. So give Jungle Plant a call at 462-5806 or visit jungleplant.com. I'm Jim Bohannon, host of America in the Morning. Each day, we take you around America and the world to bring you the latest. And while we keep our eye on the top news, we never lose sight of all the information you need to make your life complete. Morning Drive jumpstarts your day. What jumpstarts your morning drive? We'd like to join Jim Bohannon on America in the Morning, 5 to 6, Monday through Friday on KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is author and filmmaker Molly Knight Raskin. And we were talking about the impact Daniel Lewin's company, Akamai, had on improving the speed of the Internet and how the company continues to move one-third of Internet traffic even today. So shifting gears for a moment, it, it took a while to piece together what happened in the cabin to the passengers. Do you think the media stayed away from telling in-depth stories like Lewin's out of respect for the families? Absolutely. I think, you know, I've been asked that or the question, you know, why didn't we know this story? Why hadn't this story been told before? Um, Many times it was a question I asked myself when I started writing the book. But, you know, my answer to that is, is twofold. I mean, one, I think it's just that you know, grief, everybody exhibits grief in their own way. It's very personal. And, you know, I think this story was different for me because as a journalist, you know, I'm trained to sort of go after the story and, you know, I've got to go after it quickly and and do it right away and, and work around those issues. But this was a story that just really wasn't ready until the people who kept it close to them were prepared to share it. And so that's something that, you know, really, I had to to do differently in writing the book, which was to think carefully about how I wanted to, um, you know, convince them to get involved in telling Danny's story. And my case for it was, was, I think, pretty strong, which was that Danny's story could help change the world. And if people knew his story and were inspired to create something that outlived them and outlasts them, that changes the world, then the world could be a better place. And I, and you know, so I hope that's what I achieved. But I, I do think the story was not ready, and I do think that there were many people close to him who were still really just shattered by grief. It must have been difficult to approach some of the family members when you were attempting to interview them. It was. It was very difficult um, because, you know, a priority to me, again, not just as a journalist, but also just as a human being, is to respect people's grief and to uh, you know, approach these stories with, you know, the utmost sensitivity. It's it's critical. And, you know, I certainly put myself in the shoes of the people that I interviewed for the book. I mean, I'm a mother of two. And, and when I flew to Israel to meet with Danny's parents, um, I you know, I, I tried to put myself in that position. I, I, I very carefully, you know, sort of talked to myself beforehand about what, you know, what it's, what it must be like to lose a child. And I, I can't imagine that. And so when I approached them, um, yeah, I did so very sensitively. I mean, it was, it was difficult, but I think in the end it was about trust and it was about, you know, getting people to trust me with a story that they'd held close to them for a long time. And um, I did that really by just being genuine. I mean, you know, by saying things like I said earlier on this program, which was that once I learned about Danny and the kind of person he was and this 
this technology he created, I was up at night. It kept me up at night. I was excited by it. I was inspired. And the story wasn't about the way he died. That was part of it, but it was about the way he lived and what he created. And and so what is the takeaway from this book? What can we learn from Lewin's story? Well, for me, the takeaway from the book is, is really, uh, you know, something that I hope serves as a catalyst for positive change, you know, whether it's just on an individual level, societal, what people decide to contribute. You know, the reason I wrote the book is because to me, it was about this, this, this young man who was, he was complicated. He, he was, he, he wasn't without faults. He was um, a complex, difficult character. But what he had, which was unquestionable, was this incredible drive, this innate um, drive to create something bigger than himself, to change the world. And, you know, there, there, there aren't many people like that at a young age and who actually execute what it is their vision, you know, a grand vision in the way that he did. And there are people who, you know, 11 years later would say they only met him for 15 minutes and they still remember him. And these were people who were, you know, who are today big giants in internet and technology industries. So the takeaway for me from the book was, again, coming coming from it, um, you know, I'm a person with no background in computer science or technology. So I wrote the book as the story of an incredibly motivated human being, as a story of innovation, and as a story that really, I hope, demonstrates to people that, you know, we all have within us the ability to create something bigger than ourselves. And maybe that's through our children. Maybe that's through um, our writing, our art, our science, whatever it is, we have it. And so um, Danny seemed to have an innate sense at a young age that our time is short and that we, 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 should, we can do something to change the world. And that's really why I wrote the book. I was totally inspired by that message. And it still inspires me to this day, I think. Well, it is an important message and a wonderful book, and I highly recommend it. Once again, the title of the book is No Better Time, and I am afraid that is all the time we have left this hour. But uh, before we say goodbye, I want to thank you for um, honoring Daniel Lewin and his contribution to society. Thank you, Ms. Raskin. Well, thanks for so much for having me on the program. It was really a pleasure and always a, a really a joy to have the opportunity to speak about Danny's life and speak about the book. So. I'll come back anytime. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with Molly Knight Raskin, you can drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or at our website at RebeccaCosta.com. And while you're at the website, be sure to check out our new bookstore. I, I receive a lot of emails asking me what I'm reading, mainly from parents and teachers across the country. So we created a bookstore which has the books which have had a great impact on me. In fact, Molly Knight Raskin's book, No Better Time, is available at that bookstore right now. So go to RebeccaCosta.com and get your copy. Uh, in terms of what I'm currently reading uh, and and have been this last month, I, I, I often do this. I'll pick up a book that's important. And right now I'm uh, rereading Edward Wilson's book, The Creation which is written in the form of a letter and a plea from one of the greatest evolutionary biologists in the world to a man of the cloth. Wilson's appeal to people of faith to join with environmentalists to save what he calls God's creation is masterful and also written in beautiful language. And and it's a short read, one that can be read in one night, and it's available on our new bookstore page at RebeccaCosta.com. But here's some really wonderful news. When you click on any book on our site, it takes you right over to Amazon. And then anything you order when you land on the Amazon site, whether it's a a different book, a video camera, a DVD, a printer cartridge, just anything uh, that you order, uh, when you go through our bookstore to get to Amazon, that will cause Amazon to make a donation to the Costa Report. That, that's right. It'll cost you nothing to support excellent postpartisan broadcasting. Every time you shop at Amazon, you have an opportunity to make a donation to us. So uh, the next time you sh- you're, you're getting ready to shop on Amazon, please remember, don't go directly to Amazon. Go to RebeccaCosta.com first. And then click on any book on our bookstore page, which will take you right over to Amazon. And when you do it that way, you help to keep the only nationally syndicated, completely independent news magazine on the air. 
the Costa Report is one of the last independent news broadcasts left in our country, and we intend to keep it that way. So we've made it easy and also free, completely free, for you to keep independent broadcasting on the air. Uh, Broadcasting that's beholding to no sponsor, no corporation, no large media outlet. Just click on our website when you want to make a purchase from Amazon. And uh, before we run out of time, uh, I want to remind listeners that if you have a guest that you would like to hear from, it's very easy to let us know who that guest is, uh, and we'll make every effort to try to get them on the air. You can drop us a line at RebeccaCosta.com. We get some of our best ideas from listeners like yourself. So uh, keep your suggestions coming, uh, and, and be sure to register when you go to our website so that you receive our monthly newsletter, and that will give you a preview of all of the guests that are coming up in the upcoming months. So that's RebeccaCosta.com. I think you'll enjoy the website. There's videos. There are. Uh, there's a very interesting blog. <laughs> we saw, well, Actually, you know, most of our programs, we don't have so much of a sense of humor, but uh, I think the blog is, uh, is really almost turning into a little bit of comedy relief at, at moments. Um, and I think you'll enjoy the blog there as well. Uh, we also have former... Uh, episodes of the Costa Report going back, I believe, two years. So uh, check out the website uh, and uh, and across the top of the homepage, you'll see uh, a number of other pages that you can link to as well, which are videos, photographs, endorsements by uh, famous figures like Richard Branson and um, uh, Donald Trump. We even got a, an endorsement from Donald Trump. So you might have some fun uh, hearing what uh, what Donald Trump has to say about the book and also uh, the Costa Report. Now stay tuned for another hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. 